We're going to be in Luke chapter 22. We're in the New King James Version. If you want to follow along, we're going to be picking up in verse 63 where Pastor Kevin left off. Pastor David shared last week the history he has memorized and can just uh, bring forth without looking at notes is amazing to me. I thoroughly enjoyed that. It's cool. We have a homeschool co-op here called Classical Conversations. They've been meeting in our facility for several years. Um, Several elders' wives are involved and deacons' wives and our families and and many of you here are involved with that homeschool co-op, Classical Conversations. And when Pastor David was talking about Columbus last week, a lot of the facts that he was saying, I could hear the repetition of it among students and moms around me as they were recognizing those facts. It was really cool. So shout out to Classical Conversations and the blessing they are in that homeschool co-op. All right, so we prayed. We're going to be jumping in in verse 63. The title today is Who Is and Who Was and Who Is to Come. That's the way the scripture actually says it in Revelation. It says who is, who was, and who is, who is to come. All right, Luke 22, verse 63 says this. Now the men who held Jesus mocked and beat him. Let's pause. Here we go. One of the most intense portions of Scripture. Okay, the Inquisition of Jesus. The beginning of his trial, on to his crucifixion, and thankfully his resurrection. But here we see Jesus was mocked in verse 63. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. Remember, here's what happened, okay? Just so you know, fresh our memories up. Jesus was in the garden on the Mount of Olives, praying. He was arrested by, it it could be that they brought 600 men with them to arrest Jesus, okay? It could be that they brought 600. And Jesus talking about being able to bring 60,000 angels at the drop of the hat, put your sword away, okay, to Peter. So they arrest him and they take him to Annas' house, who was the high priest before Rome took control of Jerusalem. They removed him from his position of authority and they put his son-in-law in power, Caiaphas. But first Jesus was taken to Annas, then to Caiaphas. They were either living next door to each other, seemingly according to history, or very close in Jerusalem. Remember the population here was, it could have been during the feast, 600,000 people, maybe to 1 million because every, it was a pilgrimage feast and everybody from the land of Israel, the Hebrews were called to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. So we had an influx of population during this time. So Jesus was arrested. He was taken to Annas' house, then to Caiaphas' house who was given power as high priest by Rome. After Caiaphas, he went to Pilate in the Praetorium, um, Antonio's Fortress, which is north of Jerusalem, just a stone's throw from the temple. Um, And then after he went to Pilate, he went to Herod, who had a little bit broader jurisdiction toward Galilee, the northern area of Israel. After Herod, Jesus went back to Pilate, and then he was crucified. So six things there, right? He went to Annas, he went to Caiaphas, he went to Pilate, he went to Herod, he went to, back to Pilate, and oh, I missed the Sanhedrin, sorry, Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, which was the 70, the ruling party, uh, the religious government, okay, Annas, Caiaphas, Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod, Pilate, that's the trial that Jesus went through. Now, it wasn't all in the same location, Annas's house Caiaphas' house, the Sanhedrin, could have been in the backyard, the court, okay, area. Then to Pilate, north of the temple. Then to Herod. Herod could have been at the same palace because actually technically it was Herod's palace. Doubt they went all the way to Caesarea Maritima, which was on the, sea, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Doubt they went that far. 
That would be a long walk to get all that walking done in one night or early in the morning before the crucifixion. So went to see Herod, then a short walk back to see Pilate. And then the garden tomb. So there's two places where people say that Jesus may have been crucified. The Catholic Church says the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. They say that there's uh, within the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, there was a place where Jesus was crucified, okay? But that's contrary to what the Word of God says because the Word of God says in the Old Testament that the scapegoat was to be taken outside the city walls. So it would seem that that wouldn't be accurate according to the Bible that he was crucified at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but that he was crucified um, at the garden tomb, okay? The garden tomb, which is just outside the city walls of Jerusalem, Okay, I wish I had dimensions to show you, but I don't. So another reason why it was likely the garden tomb where Jesus, he was crucified above it, right beside the garden tomb. Listen, I know, follow with me. I wasn't planning on sharing this. Ta-da, ta-da. So you got the garden tomb, which is outside of Jerusalem, right beside it, kind of around the corner. I would say like at Forsyth Tech, not even that far, the building next to ours right now, there is a large hill. And on the face of the hill, there is, it's cliff, it's rock. I would say it's 40 foot tall. It's just guessing I could be really wrong, but on the face of this cliff. So imagine if you're looking at this wall behind me and the rock face of the cliff is what? Looks like a skull. Okay, this looks like a skull. It's clear, it's easy to see. It's like, you look at it, you're like, oh, that looks like a skull face, okay? Well, the Bible says that he was crucified on Golgotha or place of the skull, okay? So it would be easy for Jesus to be crucified outside the city walls, okay? Um, And be taken not far from the place of the cross, the place of the skull to this garden tomb, very close in proximity. So that's what we're getting ready to go through, all those phases. Now, remember here, Jesus' crucifixion, his trial, it was prophesied. In other words, it was already foretold in the word of God, written, well, we're gonna read one place, 1,000 years before this happened, okay? But it's throughout scripture, but this particular verse Psalm 22, seven through eight says, all who see me sneer at me. And the Hebrew sneer there is more toward the word mocked in Greek. So all who see me sneer at me, they separate with the lip, they wag with the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. That's beautiful. we Remember prophecy. Prophecy can be for the now and also in the future at the same time. You can read a biblical verse that applies directly to your life in the moment and it also can be speaking about a future event, okay, in history. And King David is writing and he, he thought he was, you know, writing just about his life, but he was also writing prophetically about the Holy Spirit and what was gonna happen to Jesus. Jesus did this And he was called to do this. Jesus went through this trial of injustice and he was called to do it. So you can look at a situation and see injustice and be like, man, I can't believe you went through that. Okay? And I'm not speaking into your life. I'm speaking as an example and I'm looking specifically at the life of Jesus, our Messiah, you can look at this injustice in this trial and say, man, I can't believe you went that. But he was called to go through that. There will be times of injustice in your life where you are called to go through it for the greatest glory of the Lord in your life. Now, our flesh in that moment would love to defend ourselves or to call out that injustice. And I'm no doubt there's seasons for that. Psalm 69.4 says, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. 
they are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen, stolen nothing, I still must restore it. If there was ever a human being on trial who could rightly say he was falsely accused, it was the son of God. And if there was anyone who was in the midst of an unjust trial, who was falsely accused, who could get their way out of it at the snap of fingers, it was the son of God. Do you think a trial could hold Jesus down? But it was already prophetically spoken that this is what was supposed to happen for the redemption of humanity to come about. I have a question. Have you mocked Jesus? Have I mocked Jesus? Of, of course I've sneered at Jesus. Let me ask you this more specifically. Maybe this will help it click. Have your actions mocked Jesus? Have my actions mocked Jesus? Most definitely, unfortunately, more than one time, I've mocked the Lord. An example of this is Jesus speaking to me about something he's called me to do and me putting my hands up either mentally or in my heart or verbally against what he said. Like, pfft. It could even be something spiritual. Jesus could say, hey, I'm calling you to be a missionary or I'm calling you to be a nurse or I'm calling you to own a business, a small business in the area. Jesus could be speaking this to you through the testimony of two or three witnesses. You come in here on Sunday morning, there's already been an inkling that God is speaking to you about something. We're in the text and the Holy Spirit reaffirms what he's speaking to you. And then you're in the hallway and someone else says something. Hey man, you know, have you ever thought about starting a small business? And you're like, whatever, God. You got the wrong person, God. God, you're silly. Now to, to you that might seem trivial, but if you carry out that rejection of what Christ has called you to do, Is it trivial? Verse 64. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things. They blasphemously spoke against him. He covered his face up when they popped him. The son of God. Matthew 26, 67 through 68 in the NASB, it says, Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fist. And others slapped him. You always got that person trying to jump in, don't you? And said, prophesy to us, you Christ. You know what they're saying? Prophesy to us, anointed one of God. Who is the one who hit you? So that was a correlated text from a different perspective, same incident. But in Isaiah, who prophesied around 700 B.C., so 700 years before this happened, this was written. Watch this. 700 years before this, this was written. Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. He gave them his face. when they went to pluck his beard out. They got something over his head so they can't see him. 
so that so he can't see them when they're popping them, the Son of God, God himself in human flesh, covered up, and they're boxing his face. Do you ever think there's a time God can't see you? Do, we, do they, did they really think that if he was God, he couldn't see who was hitting them? When I go hide myself in the dark to sin, do I really think God can't see me? When I'm in my closet or when I'm wherever, late at night, do I think God can't see me? Do you ever think there's a time that God can't see you? Do you think he sees us now? If he's God? Listen, I know who I'm talking to, okay, when I say these things this morning. Some of these things will be directly for you this morning. Some of these things may equip you to share with others, okay? So if I say something strong, I'm not, I'm not accusing you, okay? You might be being equipped by the Holy Spirit. You might be, being, you might be convicted. That's none of my business necessarily, let the Lord do his work in your heart this morning. Amen? Amen. Let the Lord do his work in your heart this morning. Do you ever think there's a time that God can't see you? Mark 7 verse 6 says, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, the people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. These were the religious people. These were the representation of God's character and nature before the people who were hitting the Son of God. They had been walking around for years saying, we follow God. We know what it looks like to follow God. With their mouth they were doing that. And then they punched him in his. I've done it. I have. Listen, God wants to prophesy in your life, however, it may be different than your expectations. Think about this, okay? Jesus, who is, who was, and who is to come. So when these prophecies were written about him 700 years ago, do you think he, heard, he knew what the prophecies were, right? Do you think that was something in and of itself exciting? Hey, your beard's going to be plucked out in about 700 years. You're going to be beaten. They're going to put something over your head and punch you. If someone spoke that over your life, would you be like, sign me up? No. Okay. But... Were these prophecies fulfilled the greatest act to human history ever? So sometimes God might speak something into your life that you'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. But maybe that hard prophecy, that challenging word that he spoke into your life is going to bring about the greatest blessing to the people around you for God's glory. Right, and I agree with celebrating God being glorified in the most amount of people possible in our life. Amen. In that moment, though, we need tons of grace and mercy. Rejecting the Lord's prophecies and plans for your life can cause a life of bitterness. I know this is a lot of milk for everybody, but Should not have said that. Rejecting God's prophetic plan for your life can cause stagnant birdbath water in your heart. You ever seen a birdbath, right? The water just sits there and it gets what? Nasty, okay? So if God is pouring into your life his Holy Spirit, and you're letting that which he's called you to do just sit there. 
it turns into stinky, nasty water instead of being a river of blessing to other people. And so maybe perhaps, maybe you're a Christian who's walking around in anxiety. I'm not saying all anxiety is directly related to this, but I was just thinking about it. Like, if you're rejecting what he's doing, don't you think you'll lack some peace? Listen to this. Are you willing for Jesus to be your Lord or just your Savior? You're like, God, I don't want to go to hell, but I ain't trying to be poured out. I'm not, hey, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm like, it is what it is. This, hey, the Lord told me to share, so I'm going to, you know, whatever. I'm going to bring it. So if it's not for you, praise the Lord too. All right, anyways. Um, here's one, Romans 12. Think about this. You're like, well, how am I supposed to know? Man, I asked that question so much when I came to the Lord. Like, when he was stirring my heart, you know? Like, Romans 12, you know, one and two, right? The first part, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, so he says, present yourself to God, Paul says to the Roman church. Now listen, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So listen, present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world, okay? Then conditionally upon those things, God will show you what you're supposed to do. Any father knows that he can't spill all the beans to his children at one time. And he wants to see effort. Like it's like raising someone up into leadership. If we were to tell someone too early sometimes that they're gonna be a powerful leader before they go through some of the training processes that are vital to them walking in that leadership role, they could get prideful, they could assume, they could try and get into the role too soon before God has prepared their heart for them to walk in it. That's a practical teaching point, right? And so God does the same thing with with us. He says, present yourself to me. Don't be conformed to the world that people are trying to tell you you need to be like. And I will show you what you're called to do. It's not too late no matter how old you are. It's not too early no matter how young you are to say yes to Jesus, to reject the conformity of the world and say, God, I'm gonna do whatever you tell me to do. I'm listening. Man, you talk about a life of adventure. I saw people dancing in the street yesterday on TV, celebrating. Okay. I also saw people celebrating just a few minutes ago in here. And I was happy to be a part of it. I was happy to be worshiping Jesus. Man, we got something to celebrate. Jesus is in charge. Hello. I'm celebrating, man. It's 24-7. The world is not in authority necessarily. The only authority they have has been delegated to them by the king. All right. So the life lesson, receive God's good promises and prophecies for your life, even when they differ from your expectations. Listen, family, church, friends, acquaintances, if this is your first time here, if you've been here a hundred times, if you're watching on the iCampus, you're listening, listening to a podcast, receive God's good promises and prophecies for your life, even when they differ from your expectations. Even if they sound harsh and heavy and hard, God might say, hey, I want you to start tithing. Hey, you're already giving 10%. I want you to start giving 20%. And you're like, well, that's going to be a sacrifice. I don't want that, God, but I'm calling you to do it. Watch the blessing that it will bring later if you obey him now. Totally unplanned. God is more concerned with your eternal state than your temporal comfort. You can write that down. He's more concerned with your eternal state than he is our temporal comfort. Blasphemio, the Greek there. To speak reproachfully, to rail at, to revile. I don't know what that next word is. Columinate. It's okay. 
to blaspheme. Listen to this. Do we speak things about God that are untrue? Do we speak things about God that are untrue? In the workplace, you're like, I was saying this to someone earlier. If you have an idea, okay, if you have a belief, okay, and you hold that belief in higher authority than God's word, the word's not the problem. When you're you're discussing something with someone in today's cultural climate, okay, it's important that you share that it's rooted and grounded in the word of God. Because if you don't mention that that is your authority, even if they don't believe it, now you're just according to them standing on an idea and a, a, a mental principle and they are doing the same thing. So who's to say who is right? You got me? Does that make any sense? If it doesn't, I'm sorry. So if, you, if, if you're in the workplace and you're sharing your faith or if you're bringing up a biblical principle but not attributing it to the word of God, to the person you're debating with who also has an idea, they just consider what you're saying an idea too and they're gonna say, well, who's to say? But if you are repeating a biblical principle, a scriptural foundational truth, whether they reject it or not, they're going to know that you're speaking from a place of authority. And maybe not in that moment they won't acknowledge it, but if his word doesn't return void and you're repeating his word and giving him the glory for it, watch what happens. Got a long way to go, but I'm going to go fast. God is not okay with our sin. He isn't okay with our sin. Listen, we are the ones who beat Jesus. Did you hear that? We are the ones who beat Jesus. You're like, I I wasn't there. How often have God spoken something in our life, be it small, be it big, and we've rejected it? Or how often publicly have we denied the Lord? Or how often have we lied? Sorry, I'm fidgeting with this wire. I'm going to fix it right now, hopefully. Or not. Whatever. Okay. Listen to this. Most often the reason we reject Jesus or his prophecies into our life is because we think we know better or we want something different. We either think we know better than what Jesus is saying or we want something different, okay? But the death of me is the life of me. The death of me in Christ is the life of me in him. The death of me is where life is found. Verse 66. Verse 66. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you're the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. They're like, Tell us if you're Jesus or not, you know, the Son of God. And he's like, If I tell you, you're not going to believe. And if I ask you the same question, you're not going to answer me. Or you won't let me go. In verse 69, he says, Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. 
They thought that Jesus was committing blasphemy by calling himself God's son, okay? The benefit of the doubt there, it's true, is that they thought that he was calling himself equal with God. And, um, well, Daniel 7. So, so it says here, God says here that... Um, he will reign with, forever with the Father. Daniel seven thirteen and 14 says, I kept looking in the night visions. Does anybody have any water? An usher, do we have any water? We're good? Okay, thank you. I think we're good. Sorry, it's cool. We want everybody to be all right. Um, Daniel seven thirteen through 14. Listen to this, okay? I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, the with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This was written during the Babylonian captivity, which started debatably from 686 B.C. up until 516 perhaps a little bit longer or closer to the time of Jesus before that. So my point is this. We have these um, prophetic revelations in the word of God that are sequential. And it starts a thousand, even before that, starts in the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. But these prophecies were given about the Messiah, okay? And some of the prophecies given about Jesus Christ were that he was going to be beaten. Later on in the scriptures, after those things were written, it was written that he was going to be reigning with the Father eternally. So there's a, sometimes there's a sequence of events that God speaks into your life and maybe he doesn't give you the whole picture all at one time. He gives you a part. Maybe he gives you more of the picture than what you expect, but it's not time yet. Listen to this. Jesus was likely, possibly, strong potential. Jesus was likely in a dungeon in the bottom of the high priest house while he was waiting to go before the Sanhedrin. Jesus was likely potentially in a dungeon, in a small holding area below, in the basement of the high priest Caiaphas' house. Exactly where he was supposed to be. You're like, he's, he's potentially in a, okay, if it was a holding cell. To whatever degree, Jesus was in captivity. He was arrested, okay? There is, at the bottom of Caiaphas' house in Jerusalem, there's a small chamber that potentially Jesus could have been in, being held. To whatever degree he was being held, as t there was some debate going on about what to do with him, and that's exactly where he was supposed to be. Do you find yourself in a trying time right now? Jesus was on a mission to save us. He's the hero. Jesus was on a mission to save us. He's the hero. And for the hero to save us, he had to go through this. Everything happening to him should have been happening to me. Everything happening to Jesus should have been happening to me. When you sign up to follow Jesus here, you may find yourself in a dungeon and it may be exactly where you're supposed to be. You see, Jesus would go back to his throne, but before he went back to his throne, he came to rescue humanity. Look at verse 67 and 68 again. It says, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or go. Have you heard from God? 
however he's communicated to you that Jesus is the Christos, the Mashiach, the anointed one of God. Has God spoken that to you? At some form, some time, has he done that in some way? Maybe through the radio, Jesus has revealed, the Holy Spirit has revealed Jesus is the Messiah to you. My question is, do you believe? And have you asked sarcastic questions just just to be cordial? Or do you really want to apply it? They're asking Jesus, tell us if you're the son of God or not, okay? They're asking sarcastically and even to use it against him, okay? So when you ask God a question, why are you asking him? And are you going to apply his answer? Am I going to apply what God has given me as his answer? I have another question. So you've asked, you've asked, you, we ask God's, we ask God questions, okay? We ask God a question. Are we ready to apply his answer? One, two, God asks you questions. Are you giving him an answer? I pray, I hope, I hope that God is talking to somebody in this room. Even if it's just once, and I'm not asking for a response right now at all. But, but, but he is. Our response to God, if wrong, will never change the truth about him. Our response, if wrong, will not change the truth about him. Oh, man. Here we go. Um, Let's do it. Uh, So, just so you know, I wrote these notes last week before Sunday morning service started. It's true. I put together this teaching last Sunday morning. Okay? In the prior week. Since last week, I did not open the notes except for one time on Monday. Quickly. And since last Sunday, after opening the notes only once, which was on Monday, quickly, I have not looked at these notes again since Monday. That I'm looking, I looked at them this morning. Again, I thought maybe I should just look over it one more time. If you're like, we could tell. <laughs> you should look at them a little bit earlier. Okay. My bad. All right. Intentionally. And, and I only added two passages in here this morning. Okay. And what I'm about to talk about, I did not add in this morning. Okay. This was written last week. I don't know why I segued into something that I'm trying not to segue into, but. Mm. So we talked about, have you heard from God? You know, the truth about God. Uh, So we've. Last night, you know, or yesterday, there was an election, right, uh, announcement, uh, you know, that the president-elect currently, according to where we're at, I understand the electoral vote hasn't happened yet. Um, I understand the sequence of events during any election, even after the popular vote happens, there's always more to the election, okay? But... Right now where we stand in the progression of events is, you know, someone has been named president for the future. And that's, okay, so um, you know, last night I was listening because the Lord asked me to watch, you know, a speech. And beforehand, before the speech started, there was a stage set up. Hey, man, wherever you are on what I'm about to say, just, just listen, okay? You hear me? Please, would you listen? 
where, so anyway, so there was a stage like this and they had media slides going just like this and on the slides was rotating science, truth, empathy, and unity. I was rotating on the, the slides before the president, current president-elect spoke last night. And um, during his speech, he quoted some scripture. For real. Quoted some Bible. And just clearly and specifically, the agenda that is being brought forth from the president-elect. I'm not saying that our current president has always brought forth, you know, everything perfect. We're all humans. But there's some specific agendas that are looking to be implemented under the new cabinet that are contrary to the word of God. Okay? You know that. And one of those is abortion, okay? Abortion, clearly in Psalm 139, is is spoken about that life starts in the womb, okay? It's, you know, the interesting thing about the word science is the word science means what? Knowledge. Conscience is conscience. It means with knowledge. So, God says that he's placed a conscience within us and he's written, his, he's written his word across our hearts. So we are with knowledge by having a conscience. But science just says it's knowledge. So that knowledge that someone we think we may have might not be accurate. We think we have some knowledge. There may be other knowledge that science There may be other knowledge introduced later that changes our initial theory. Happens for thousands of years, right? The world's flat. No, it's round. Shh. I know there's some flat earthers in the world. It's okay. But my point is, it changes. Science, the the knowledge that we have, that we think we know, it changes, okay? So, Someone said, well, I mean, just keep digging a hole, don't I, up here. Um, Abortion, back to abortion. The reason why I don't talk about abortion much is because I've had two. Before I was married, okay. Okay. And this is why I don't talk about it. One was, I was 15 years old, okay? Knew God but rejected him as God in my life and had had an abortion, okay? Too soon after that as well, I had another abortion, late term. Very late term where I had to drive to another area for it to be done. And the person who was involved, just being honest, you know, it was not my wife. And she's fully aware of this conversation that we're having. Um, the, the person that had, you know, had the abortion specifically, walked out of that room a different person. They walked, the person who who I was with walked out a different person for as long as I knew them after the fact. A first-hand experience as close as possibly can at being a male that there's something spiritually wrong with it. I 
I'm not getting into the percentages about women's health care where, you know, decisions need to be made. I do know that the percentages where that is an actual issue are minute compared to the number of abortions that are being had. I also know that Pastor Nick did a phenomenal teaching a couple years ago about this. And he talked about the laws that we've passed in our country that place greater protections on sea turtles than they do human life. And don't say living sea turtles that have been hatched because actually even the ones still in the shell, there are laws if you mess with them. So either life starts in the womb or it doesn't. And America can't have it both ways according to their opinion. So it's important for us to recognize there will be people who, me included sometimes, reject clear biblical principle and the application of it in my life. That doesn't mean it's right. Sin is sin and sin is wrong. It dishonors God. An abortion family is sin. And so it would be contrary to our faith to support legislature, legislature that supports abortion. But that's why I don't always or haven't been specific about it. Thank Jesus for grace and for mercy. So, the life lesson is, God's truth is the truth. And the blessing for you will always be to heed it. What further proof do we need that it's wisdom to surrender our life to Jesus? Look what he's doing for you. That we're reading about this morning. Chapter 23. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they begin to accuse him saying, if we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is a Christ, a king. Oh, okay, so. Just to clarify, if, if there's not a common understanding through, when I make this statement, su- such a strong statement as I just did, I precluded it with personal experience. So, and I also closed it with, there's grace and mercy, we can be forgiven. Men, if you've been involved, ladies, if you've, if you've been through that experience, listen, you can be forgiven and there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so when you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, he says yes, because he already took the punishment. You're forgiven. He doesn't, he's not looking at you and seeing sin. He sees his child, you. Okay? Back to it. We just read verses 1 and 2. I'll read verse 2 again. And they begin to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Matthew 17, correlating scripture, 24 to 27, New Living Translation. It says, on their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple, oh. So, look, let me, they just said that Jesus forbade to pay taxes. You saw that clearly, right? But you know the story in Matthew 17. On their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does. 
Peter replied. Then he went into the house, but before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, what do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? They tax the people they've conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake, throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. Jesus paid the taxes, okay? There it is. They accused him of not. It was a blatant lie. Psalm 35, 11, another prophecy. Malicious witnesses testify against me. They accuse me of crimes I know nothing about. Okay, and this is what's happening. They just accused him of not paying taxes. We all know that he was without fault. And not only that, if you had any curiosities, he did pay tax. Listen to this. People will often manipulate, deceive, to persuade us. People, people will often manipulate and dis, dis, they walk in deceit. They want to deceive us to persuade us to a certain point. And they even looked at Jesus in his own face and be like, you didn't pay taxes. Often the whole multitude, just like in this moment, will be standing against Jesus around you. Often you're going to be in situations where the multitude around you is going to be standing against Jesus. He still sees. Peter may have denied, are you ready for this? Peter may have denied Jesus and the whole multitude around him were rejecting the Lord, but Peter and John were there. They had followed and the rest scattered. You hear that? Peter may have denied Jesus, but he was there. Verse 3. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowd, I found no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Matthew 27. 11 through 14, New Living Translation says this. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they're bringing against you, Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Prophesied 700 years before. Jesus claimed to be God and is foundational to our faith. Listen to these couple things. Miracles don't make people follow Jesus long term. They only create a craving for more. Miracles don't create long term disciples. It only creates a hunger for more miracles. So sometimes God doesn't do all the fireworks in your life because he doesn't want you chasing the fireworks. He wants you pursuing him without all the luster in the moment. And there's seasons in our life where God uses fireworks to encourage us, to woo us in, to show us his sovereignty, his authority, and his, powerful, his power. But there's other times where God stops the fireworks and he just sits there on the throne in your heart if you allow him. And may the just pure love of who he is continue to propel us forward in following him. Okay? That's a, that's a mature thing. I don't know. Because when I first started following Jesus, I was chasing signs and wonders. Okay? Like uh, in the year, it doesn't matter, several years ago, 20 
20 years ago-ish, when I started following Jesus, the congregation that I was, or congregations that I were around, there, there was a recognition that the word was the authority, but there was also a consistent looking for display of signs and wonders. And so when the signs and wonders weren't abundant, and there was a uh, lack, honestly, of excitement for the Lord. Okay? So, you know, think about this. Miracles didn't make the Israelites be long-term followers of God during the Exodus. I mean, they had already started worshiping the calf not long after being in the desert. All right, here's one more thing that I think is important to this. I hope we get to verse 12 today. So I'm gonna speed up a little bit more. If not, we'll stop short of where I intended to go. We, we know this well, church, okay? Rome only had capital punishment rights for this small window in history to execute the Jews, right? On the cross, even more specifically, okay? Uh, the capital punishment rights and authority of Israel had been turned over to Rome because they were governing, all right? So check this out. It took unfavorable ideological authority to create the opportunity for Jesus to have the greatest impact on humanity. Listen, it took unfavorable to our faith, unfavorable to Christianity. It took unfavorable ideological authority to create the opportunity for Jesus to have the greatest impact on humanity. Think about this. If there was a favorable government, Jesus would not have been crucified. And if Jesus was not crucified, our sins would not have been paid for. So in an opposition government and an opposition authority created the opportunity for the greatest act of mankind. Thank you. So, I understand that we're in a tumultuous political climate. We might be standing right before one of our greatest opportunities in history in our, in our life. Listen to this. I went to Washington, D.C. and prayed with 50,000-ish people, okay? Why do you think the 50,000 people came together? Because everything was hunky-dory? or the non-hunky-doriness created prayer. And who doesn't need to be praying? You see, sometimes when the wick is turned up, my faith is ignited. And when everything is rosy and sweet in my pockets, I'm really not, I'm really not pushing for Jesus as much, am I? We probably want to be on fire for Jesus and Jesus is like, well, let me turn up a little persecution in your life. And now Jesus might be, we don't, I don't know, maybe creating more persecution for the church. Look at church history, the seven letters to the seven churches. The, the, church, the, the, the church age, when the government was most favorable to Christians was during Constantine. When it was, when it was the cool thing to do to become a Christian. So everybody was becoming, they were all becoming Christians. Like, yeah, I follow Jesus. I'm not, I don't know about true conversion then. It's, trust the Lord with true conversion then, right? I'm sure people really gave their life to Jesus during Constantine. But the next letter to the next church in church history was the greatest corruption ever that we're still, deal, still dealing with today. The dogma that we are not saved by grace and grace alone but that we have to do works and we're still unsure if we're gonna get into heaven or not. That dogma, that false doctrine was introduced right after the greatest favorable period for the church when the government said, hey, it's cool to become a Christian. That created opportunity for the coldness of the church, even for deceit, 
to the point where it's led millions of people astray even up until today's history. So I'm just being honest. I'm not saying that we shouldn't vote or we shouldn't share our opinions, you know, and we shouldn't hope for biblical governance in our country. Of course we should, okay? But I'm showing you the other side of the picture here is it might create an ignition toward the end times events where revival happens. And I'm not, I, I, I can't rationalize in my head how something that is so reproachful can be used for God's glory. I'm not going to even attempt to act like I know how Genesis 50, 20 works all the time. Okay? But do you hear what I'm saying? I hope, I mean, you might not agree with it, but listen, I didn't hear Jesus. I mean, really, could have been born at any point in history, and he chose then. God had foreordained it to be then. Listen, the gospel stirs things up. Oh, here's one more example. Think about the millennial reign, okay? What's, what, who's, in, who's governing, who is in authority during the millennial reign? Who's in charge during the thousand-year millennial reign on earth? Jesus. It's okay if you're wrong, but yes, you're right. It's Jesus, okay? It's Jesus. Jesus is, what happens at the millennial, end of the millennial reign? Satan's let out. Why? To test conversions. Because there's no, not as much persecution during the millennial reign for true decision to be tested. Fire always creates opportunity for ignition. I didn't write that down, but that was pretty good. Action and reaction. So verse six, all right, I'm going. Verse six, we'll hurry up. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Herod was like, yay, I get to see Jesus. I want to see a miracle. See, he wasn't even, he wasn't, it doesn't seem that he was wanting to surrender his life to the Son of God. Verse nine, then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. Again, the silence. Verse 10, then the chief priests and the scribes stood vehemently and accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Mocked again, a lot of mocking. Arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. That's where we get the Christophany, not the Christophany, but the, um, uh, you know, Joseph being a type of Christ, a picture of Jesus. He wasn't Jesus, but the robe thing, this is the part of the correlation. There's like, I think there's like over almost, there's over a hundred correlations between Joseph Slice and Jesus. I think that's right. But anyways, verse 12, that very day Pilate and Herod became friends with each other for they previously had been at enmity with each other. Okay, so they became buds. Okay, so Jesus is mocked again. If Jesus doesn't do what you want him to do, do you send him away? I, okay, thankfully not. Let me ask you this. Are the majority of our friends formed or established in Jesus or in things of the world contrary to Jesus? Are the majority of our quinonia, our communion with others, our friends, is the majority of our friends, are they formed around Jesus or things of the world? Okay. Now, I'm not saying we can't allow God to use things of the world as bridge builders, Bridge builders. Another thing, what does it take for you to choose something over Jesus? Gosh, it's convicting, right? Listen to this. The leaves and fruit in our life are indicators of what we are planting and abiding in. The leaves and the fruit in our life are indicators what we are planted in or abiding in. Do you rally people to or away from Jesus? 
According to those in charge, clearly, Jesus should have been let go, but there was a bigger picture. It did not make practical sense for Jesus to continue through this trial and be executed. But there was a bigger picture. And those watching didn't realize it until he died and rose again. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. I'm going to ask the communion table to be carried up here, please. In just a minute, we're going to have communion. How many times has Jesus communicated his love to you? Okay, you don't know. A lot, right? I saw everybody worshiping. I mean, so just dancing a little while ago, you know, moving for Jesus, giving thanks to Jesus. It was phenomenal. It was like a little picture of heaven in here earlier, wasn't it, guys? Shout out to the worship team. too. Thank you for the... Anointed musicians we have. We have anointed children's ministry volunteers. We have anointed cafe volunteers. We have anointed ushers. We have anointed media team here, a super anointed media team as well. Um, we have anointed men of God, women of God in this place. And we also have an anointed group of musicians. Thank you for them. So I'm not an anointed musician, okay? Okay? But what am I doing? Let's follow me here. I'm clapping, all right? Okay. Look. Yeah. Clap. What am I doing right now? Two things are coming together right now. One hand and another hand are coming together, okay? But it's not just about the two things coming together. It's about a recognition that it's happening. Two things are coming together right now. Prophecy's coming together. And we're here with it. Do you have a recognition where you are right now? Has God been speaking to you? Are you ready? Because I'm ready. And whatever person gets voted in, I'm following Jesus. And it says that in the end times, you can stop clapping for a minute because it'll probably be off rhythm for whatever they're doing. And definitely if I'm clapping, it's going to be off rhythm. But listen, listen, listen. Yeah, it's true. For such a time as this, we're here. God has called you. He's loved you. He's died for you. And you're here right now for such a time as this. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Blot them out. Because of what he did here, Because of what we're reading about, Jesus being unjustly tried, condemned, and killed. Our transgressions, everything that we've ever done can be blotted out. But when we're looking at this, we can see a crazy situation that doesn't make sense from practical perspective. But many people were saved and can be saved because of it. Sin will come out. Sin will come out. It will either come out in your, of your heart and your everyday activities wherever you go, or you allow Jesus to take it out, to blot it out. You're going to stand before God one day and either it's already been dealt with or it has to be dealt with then. And family, we can't live forever with God unless we've trusted Jesus as our Savior. So she's going to begin to sing. And I encourage you to please come get a cup of communion. double cup method. We have two tables today. Please get it. Go back to your seat if you don't mind. And we're going to partake together and remember Jesus. But please come get a cup.
Revelation 1, 1 through 8. NASB. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. And heed the things which are written in it. For the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. He has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. Listen, this is important. Taking the cup in an unworthy manner is... When we take the cup, we're remembering that we are one with Jesus. We're remembering what he's done for us, okay? So to take the cup in an unworthy manner would be to say, hey, Jesus, I am one with you, but I hold on to this precept that is contrary to what you say is right. I'm not saying that we won't sin. It will be covered, thankfully. I'm not saying that we won't wrestle with something this week in our life that is unhonoring to God. Unfortunately, likely, we will. However, it is wisdom for us right now to say, God, though I wrestle with these things, those things aren't what I'm choosing to follow. I follow you, Jesus. So if you have a belief or a concept or a principle in your heart or in your mind that's contrary to the written revelation of God to us, even right now, say, God, I choose you instead. I'm wrestling with this thought. I'm battling with this ideological precept. I'm battling it, 
but I don't want it to have authority. I want you to have authority. And though it's trying to tangle me up, I know that you're gonna set me free, Jesus. And it might be a wrestling match for a little bit with the flesh, but Jesus has already won the war, family. So right now, if you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, all you gotta do is receive the gift that was already paid for, your redemption. And you could do it just like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you took my punishment for dishonoring you. I've done wrong and I'm sorry. Please forgive me of all my sin. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving me and help me to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, praise God. If, you, if that's the first time you've ever prayed or given your life to Jesus, please have, have someone pray with you here, someone in leadership will be available up here. If you need direction, look, jump into serving, jump into every opportunity that we have available for you to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Listen, Jesus has everything that you need to live an abundant life in him. Go get it. Walk in it. Abide in him. Let him bring it forth in your life. The night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember Jesus. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May his countenance overshadow and surround you. And may you know his peace, his shalom, his wholeness, his blessing on your life through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, family, for being here. We love you. Have a great week in the Lord.